I'm, I'm, uh, I find that Scrum is, is very old-fashioned. It's, it's, we are doing things now that are simpler, easier, and uh, I find a lot better for even beginners to start this newer way rather than with something that's 20 years old. Uh, 20 years ago, maybe Scrum was the best way to get started. Maybe 10 years ago it was okay, but we've advanced. You know, it's like working with a laptop that's 20 years old. Are you going to do that? Just because that's what everyone's doing? It's crazy, but we keep seeing every, so many teams around the world doing the same thing. I got a product owner, I got a scrum master. Uh, it, it's, we find lots of problems with this and we've come to easier ways of doing things. So uh, it, it, this is why I'm not really a big fan of scrum. There's, I, I could go on and on about other ways to do things, but I don't know if there's a lot of time. It's just that I want you to realize there's, there's life beyond scrum. Okay, um, for me as well, um, probably Scrum is now uh, killing agility. Um, when we're being agile, we're looking at uh, new ways of doing things. Uh, with Scrum, still to some extent, we give it a lot of framework. You do these ceremonies and you should be doing these, then you're a Scrum team and so on. Uh, in fact, I don't know uh, of any team which does, you know, pure scrum by the book. They always do something which is, you know, how, but they still like to call themselves a scrum team without knowing that how agile they are. So I am also for uh, that topic. So you, you better be against, otherwise <laughs> we're not going <laughs> to go ahead in this debate now. <laughs> okay, I will uh, give a viewpoint both for and against. Um, this is the uh, difference between uh, being agile and doing agile. Um, I don't know if this is uh, specific to uh, India or whether this is prevalent in many cultures. We seem to be so obsessed with these templates. Okay, here is Scrum. This is a set of prescriptions that it gives you. You're supposed to be doing A, B, C, D, E ceremony. You've got these roles, one, two, three, four, five, and this is what your team size needs to look like. Unfortunately, in many instances, we tend to take these prescriptions at face value without trying to internalize the mindset and principles that, that goes behind it. Um, that is what I call doing agile. Um, so, uh, does Scrum kill agility? Yes. When we end up doing the ceremonies without trying to internalize the values and, and principles behind it. Um, for teams that, uh, so, so here is the, the opposite viewpoint, where Scrum doesn't necessarily kill agility, um, when, when teams don't know where to start with, when there is um, chaos and uh, lack of orderliness and everything that, that is killing a team, um, uh, you might want to consider asking, okay, why don't you start with something that was, that's still 20 years old, but uh, something that's better, better than what, uh, what you're probably doing today. Uh, so, um, yes, Scrum kills agility. In my opinion, Scrum does kill agility when you don't internalize the principles. But um, uh, yes, there is a lot of value uh, in some of the principles that Scrum created. So, what, what happens at the end of a sprint when you're trying to finish your stories but you haven't done testing and refactoring? The sprint's coming to an end. You haven't done any. You haven't written any automated tests. You've done no refactoring. But uh, your name is somewhere on some visible board, and you haven't finished. And you have some final work to do. What do you think happens? What? Spill over? Do you, do you actually ever get to the testing and refactoring? You want to hit the sprint. It's the sprint ends, right? And you don't you don't do the testing and refactoring. So we, so I understand this challenge is a real challenge. So I'm not debating that. But the way we try to address it, and we are not always perfect, but what we try to do is, as the sprint progresses, we try to see whether the stories are going to get met or not. If not, we might even drop a story and actually focus on something that's really doable, and make sure that it actually has all the things done, like. 
the testing is done, the code review is done, and if we are strained by the number of stories, it's okay to drop the stories or drop the scope of stories. That, that is what we try to do. Okay, slippage still does sometimes suffer because we think by dropping a story, we have done the right thing, but sometimes we needed to probably drop two. So there are some mistakes that still happen, but that is what we try to do. Try to reduce the scope of a sprint if we feel that we really cannot complete all the sprints. But this should not, this decision should not be taken on the last day. It should be as the sprint progresses. And that's why in daily scrum, we don't, we don't just say what we did yesterday, what we do, what we are doing today, what are the impediments. We also try to have another question. Are our stories getting done? So we go story by story. So we do talk about story one, and then we try to answer the question, is this story going to get done in the sprint? So for each story, each day, we are asking the question to ourselves, is the story getting done? If not, we discuss which is the least priority story in the sprint, we drop that, so that all the other stories at least try, try to get done. This is what we try to do. I'm not saying this is the best practice, but this is what we have been doing. And I would definitely like to hear what is the other simple way you do, because I'm really... Just on a lighter note, this function in, in those situations, call the story done, create a small story for technical debt. Somebody was telling yesterday, you sneeze and you get a point. You, you were saying this. <laughs> so. Yeah, on the initial topic, I would like to present a counter view. Uh, is Scrum killing agility? Now, all of you said uh, that there is a template that people want to adapt and uh, go as a prescription, take it as a prescription. Uh, I would say at the initial stages of maturity, when you are not mature enough, that's what anyone would do. Okay, as a as a very young, I mean, we all have young children at home, right? And we have seen babies grow. So babies just repeat what you uh, feed them, right? They probably try to imitate you, uh, take it at the face value. They start uh, memorizing some, humming some songs that they hear on TV without realizing their uh, meaning, right? And somewhere they are going to catch up with us. So I think that's a that's a valid way in which uh, we progress. And uh, even if you replace Scrum with something else, the same thing will going to, will happen. So why not Scrum? So uh, counterpoint, uh, I have a niece and a nephew. Uh, they don't uh, repeat what we do. They have their own way of doing things now. It's it's just very very new now you know probably my father uh, observed that that whatever he did i used to repeat that but then these days these kids they have their own ways of doing it that's 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 how we are trying to move from you know probably it was there for a time a little bit of time when people wanted to move from waterfall to some more structured way uh, of doing agile and then rather you know being uh, completely agile if i may also People have, I mean, I've seen teams who uh, treat a sprint as a waterfall, you know, model. So they do waterfall, 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 and they say, okay, we are doing, you know, scrum. That's the real danger when you go uh, by the... Yeah, uh, the, uh, you know, things are getting faster and faster in the world, right? They used to, something we used to do would take a long time. Now we can do it much faster. My interest is in helping people become, be, become agile, much faster, like mature agile, not years, not even, you know, many, many months, but how quickly can I get them to be relatively mature and agile? And for me, one of the biggest issues there is balance. There's a mis with Scrum, what I find is many teams adopt Scrum and they don't have any technical practices or any technical maturity, agile, you know, Agile doesn't even need, these days, the, the most popular definition of Agile, there is no definition, there's no technical stuff there at all. It's gone. I mean, literally, we go to places, giant multinational corporations, they say, we're doing Agile. And they say, okay, so you've got your Agile planning, planning tool that you've spent a fortune on, and you do sprints and stand-ups, and that's what you mean, right? And like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then what about, you know, 
continuous integration and refactoring and test driven development. What about the things about the software? Because at the end of the day, you're shipping software, I think. So, but that's the hard part. So there's no balance from the very beginning. Now, when my six-year-old daughter learned to ride a bike, she did it in a way that I never did. She learned on a tiny little bike. It happened to have, we didn't go buy a push bike. They have these push bikes now. There's no, there's no uh, pedals. But they're very low to the ground, and it's very safe to just learn how to, bat, to glide with your feet up. So you glide, and you're learning balance right from the beginning. And once you learn that balance, and it's safe because you can always put your feet down. Anytime you start moving, you put your feet down. You move, she moved from that to pedaling in one day. In one day, she's, she's biking. Incredible. This to me was like, when I looked at and there was a, a father in the park that day with a training wheels and his daughter. And I was like, I, I was like, oh. you know, I offered him our bike to try. And he's like, no, I'm not interested. What I'm saying is that there are faster, better ways to learn. And balance is critical. We have so many customers come to us and say, we've been doing this scrum for two or three years and we're not seeing any benefits and the, the software's still a mess. And we're like, we come in and we're like, oh my God, you're not doing anything. You've not changed anything about the way you do software development. All you've done is, is turn yourself into sprints, estimators, uh, story points, stand-up meetings, and you think this is gonna deliver value? I mean, there's a reason that I'm angry about this crap, because it's hurting our industry. This is supposed, Agile is supposed to make a difference, and this stuff's not. There's no balance. There's no real um, rigor there. It's terrible. So to me, uh, one of the main things about Agile was the putting focus on people, right? And then the thing that attracted me initially to Agile was the, the emphasis on developers, testers, the, the, the team members, the people, right? And nowadays, all I hear is process talk, process talk, process talk. It's all about process. And you ask, okay, what's in for me? And it's like, no, 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 it is about the customer. It is about faster time to delivery. It is about better quality. It is about this. And people are like, okay, that all makes sense, but what about me? And I don't think we have a very good answer, at least in Scrum, where people talk about what is the role of people. It all seems to be so much process-centric. Thou shall do this, thou shall do this. It's become like that. Maybe the guys didn't mean it that way, but that's, that's what we're seeing around us. And I think that's hurting us. That's hurting us real bad. And uh, I was just talking to someone. They said, yes, we are super excited. Our entire company is moving to Scrum. And I said, are you really excited? Let me spoil it for you. <laughs> right? So I asked them, do you know any successful company which was successful because of Scrum? And they listed a bunch of names. I said, that's wonderful. Do you know any company that failed because of Scrum? And they were thinking for a minute. Like, okay, you don't know any company that failed because of Scrum. So if you can say uh, the company succeeded because of Scrum, then you should also be able to find companies that failed because of Scrum. Well, I believe that the process is just a placebo. It doesn't make any difference. Uh, but if you give credit to companies for being successful because of Scrum, then you should also blame companies for, or Scrum for failing companies, right? If you, if you go down that logic. And I remember Nokia, was one of the poster childs of uh, Scrum. I mean, they used to talk so much about Scrum. They had this Scrum maturity model and all of that stuff, the assessment. And we all know the story, what happened to it, right? And people say, oh, they, they implemented Scrum badly. Of course, they implemented Scrum badly. Scrum is beautiful, but it was them implementing badly. I, I think that argument is really weak. So. Yeah. Uh, you know, I have to say something about Nokia because I was involved uh, quite a bit with Nokia. And actually, they implemented it well as well. It was not that they implemented it badly. If I know any company that is of that size personally, it is Nokia that has done a reasonably good job. I think Nokia's really, uh, reasons for failure are different. <laughs> yeah, uh, Nokia's reasons for failure are different. And which part of Nokia? There's a bunch of it. Yeah. No, I'm just saying that it is not that Nokia implemented it badly. And so you cannot blame. So I'll tell you what they did badly. Uh, 
managers put the gun against developers and said you need to have 70% code coverage. True or false? Not that you're aware of. No, that happened much later, right? So Nokia had two big divisions where they went scrum. So again, I don't mean to beat them down. I'm just taking an example for the sake of example, right? I have nothing against them. Uh, I know you're not Nokia. You. <laughs> The point is that they had all these wonderful things that they were talking about, Scrum, and I don't think there was any mention about, as Josh was talking about, any of the engineering practices. But that's not true, and that's what I'm saying. That's not true. They had a lot of mention of engineering practices, but things like you need to have 70% coverage, you would have to things like this. I've gone into the company and I've seen tests, and the tests have zero assert statements. And basically, they have a bunch of junk that they have written to satisfy the 70% coverage number, right? So they've done a lot of things which did hurt them in the long run. And if we talk about agility, right? Agility is about knowing your market, knowing your customers, staying in sync with them. And they went wrong probably because of that. Now, again, we all can act very smart in retrospective and look at why they failed. Uh, but I think they saw it coming, right? They saw it coming really well. So I really have no opinion on anything else you're saying because all I wanted to say is Nokia, at least parts that I saw, did Scrum reasonably well. And there are many, many, many other companies that do Scrum really, really badly. And to say that one of the better ones does badly, I just wanted to counter that. Okay? The point is that they did really well, why did succeed? There are many paths to failure, only a few to success. So Scrum is just one of the things that will help you succeed, not there are many other ways. Let, let me add to that. It's not a magic wand. Yeah. That's what you told me. Go ahead, Two days later, and you'll walk out. This is a funny thing, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> so because in Scrum earlier, somewhere, there's a small line that says, the certification doesn't guarantee that you, it is a small print somewhere. They didn't make it bold enough. I agree with <laughs> Yeah, that's true. But yeah, uh, anyway, uh, I, I really don't think certification is the answer. Okay, I'm from Finland, so, so Nokia's from there. <laughs> Okay, so how I see um, about Nokia, Nokia case as a Finn, because uh, Nokia was the, uh, Nokia. Uh, yeah, Nokia was the like, identity of Finnish people that time. And when we discussed about safety, what Joshua told me, well, told us uh, we discussed about safety. So I feel that Nokia, uh, how I see like Finnish, Finnish like whole society, that we are putting too much trust, we put promises top of each other, and and, and um, it feels like, um, uh, I don't know whether it's Scrum or anything else, but, uh, but somehow it's, it's just like false trust that, okay, this will, this will carry, this will go on, go on and on. But uh, now as Nokia is uh, the mobile, uh, mobile part, so to Microsoft, I feel in Finland how I see now when, st when staying one and a half year in India. So there are very, very many uh, new things, new, uh, new like, um, you know, like restaurant day was no, no word, but well, it started from Finland, that everyone can do pop-up restaurant. And, and, and I think a lot of energy also freed after, after Nokia, Nokia collapsed. And, and then uh, there are some positive, positive things also behind, behind that. Okay. <laughs> so this is good, good parts of large companies collapsing, right? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay. So, But they're also, but they're also utilizing other practices. So it's not just a scrum. They're also utilizing XP practices. Are we also going to blame XP practices as well for the collapse? So, 
just, just so I'm clear, my point is that there, is, there were several presentations, I'm not sure, the, uh, you know, various conferences, they came in and they said, we've been very successful because of Scrum, right? This is statements the Nokia employees were making consistently at various Agile conferences. You can go back in history and you can see there are lots of places where they said, we are successful because of Scrum, right? And I'm saying now that they've collapsed, can we say they failed because of Scrum? This, you, you can point to one thing and say we were successful because of that, then you should take the counter argument as well that you, you failed because of that. It, it, depends, it depends upon the situation. I mean, we were talking, we were debating about, about a topic with the Scrum is killing agility. Though agility, Scrum is just one part of agility. There are different practices. I mean, when they came up with this manifesto, it's not just scrum that they actually discussed in Ohio. They discussed all lot of practices and they combined it, came up with a manifesto. There was a XP practices, there was scrum, Kanban, all those things. It's not just scrum. I think uh, when we say, you know, we are, I'm implementing a project in scrum, I mean, we are considering only scrum as the framework we're using. But there are different other frameworks which comes together with this and they form it a team as an agile team. So, I, I mean, if you use different frameworks or the practices, you still can succeed. So, it's not just a scrum which is killing agility. I think it's the way you are implementing it. I would agree to that. It's not just scrum that's killing agility. But uh, just going back to your previous point, uh, so let's talk about 2001 when the Agile Manifesto was written. Uh, there's a lot of misconceptions about how it was written. Right? I don't know how many people are aware, but let's talk about a little dirty secret about how the manifesto was written. 17 white guys got together in a skiing resort to talk about object-oriented programming and object-oriented technologies. Agile was never really the thing, but they wanted to talk about lightweight methods, you know, how they were doing things. And they all got in, they debated, they argued, but they all agreed that we believe in similar values. Uh, and then they try to put the values together and no one could agree. So pretty much everyone left uh, except uh, Kent. Uh, Kent Beck was there. No, actually, Ward Cunningham and uh, Martin Fowler was there and one other person, I don't remember. It was actually three people who wrote the manifesto, right? And then the rest of them came back and they said, yeah, mostly it all looks good except the last point and they changed that. And then there was a big debate after that about, you know, what do we call it? And you know, a lot of people were very disappointed when they called it Agile. So that's, that's a little story about how the manifesto was written. Uh, I don't think they talk so much about the formal structure or any of those things. And that's pretty much up to people how they want to you know, implement it. I, 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 I agree with the, that point. My only uh, point is, um, I think when, we, when we're saying that a Scrum is killing agility, is it a Scrum which is killing agility? or if you combine a scrum with other factors or the practices and you start improving but you're still utilizing scrum with other practices and you're actually doing a good job you know in developing your products do you still say that is it scrum you know which is not creating these good products it's the other practices which is creating this the the, the single ringable neck the product owner role is, is really hurting people, it's hurting teams, it's a bad idea, very bad idea. Mary Poppendike, who wrote the books on Lean, completely agrees, many people agree. Shane Hasty, you just went in Shane's talk here, right? He talks about the critical importance of a cross-functional functional, uh, team where there's a value facilitator, someone who's trying to facilitate value, Right? In, the, in the large multinationals that most of you work in, right, these are complex software systems where you need input from all kinds of people to figure out what the heck to go do. The idea that one person can think this up and manage the backlog and do this work, it's cr crazy. And you know, we, all over the industry we see people saying, I have the product owner. We have the product owner. We're, 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 we're doing Scrum. And I'm like, you're on a road to disaster. You're not listening to your support people, you're not listening to your subject matter experts, you're not listening to your uh, sales people, marketing people. Um, all of the, the architects are not, their voices are not being heard when you pick what to work on. So you can have a tremendous amount of technical debt, but the product owner is not work, choosing to work on it. 
And so, great, you're heading down a road to, to disaster. It is fundamentally flawed. That's one of 20 things I could tell you that are really bad about Scrum. So yes, it is, a, it is an old-fashioned approach to agility that is filled with hazardous practices, hazardous roles and practices. It's not, it, it doesn't buy us much. All I'm saying is there are better ways. Now, I think we're remiss, we are remiss in not publishing the better ways, right? There, there are better ways, to, there are pieces of part, so Kanban. I like to see user stories flow across a Kanban board. If it's in the to do, uh, doing column lane, right, we're doing it. I can be working on it. If I'm not done testing and refactoring, I'm gonna do testing and refactoring. I, there's no end of sprint deadline where I'm gonna try to uh, hurry up real quick and get it done so I look good that I got my story done. No, I'm gonna spend the time it takes to get the thing done. Am I gonna work on small, valuable stories? Yes, I'm gonna teach teams how to work on small, valuable stories. That's critical to agility. Now, Scrum, Kanban, uh, Crystal, uh, most of these methods, right, they all punted on something critical. What are, we, what are we building? And why are we building it? And is anyone going to use it? The definition of done is brain dead. Brain dead. Because it doesn't look at the actual users using the thing. It just says, we finished. Here's the definition. We did all of our work. We wrote the term, blah, blah, blah. We did all the things. It's done. Is anyone using it in production? We don't know. Is it making anyone's life easier? We don't know, but we got it done. We are not in the deliverables business. There are people who deliver pizza. They're in the deliverables business. They deliver pizza. Our job is not to deliver features. Our job is to make better outcomes for users. And most of these old fashioned kind of agile processes, including XP, they all punted on this critical thing, focus on outcome. Newer, newer approaches like Lean Startup, they place a heavy focus on this. So, you know, who's, who's, he, who's here? I ask people, has anyone read the Lean Startup book here? Show of hands. Very, very few of you, right? Start reading books like that and get yourself beyond Scrum, right? Start reading the, uh, the Startup Owner's Manual, talking about customer development and you're going to go far beyond Scrum. And these things are not advanced. They're actually critical, and we just missed the boat on them. So that's what I'm saying. There's, there's just better stuff beyond Scrum. I think when they started, the, the, the bottleneck was, you know, software delivery seemed to be the bottleneck back in the days. And yes, at that point, it made sense to get the team together, let them to work together, and focus on getting the delivery out. Right, that was the critical bottleneck back in then. I think we've moved way beyond that, that that's no longer the bottleneck. Now we have teams that can deliver decent quality stuff at a consistent rate. That's not, a, delivery is no longer the biggest bottleneck. Where we have issues is figuring out what to build, right? What is the most important thing? And it's easy to say, oh, that's not my problem. That's the product owner's problem. But, you know, hey, we don't have this magical product owner who's going to figure all these things out. We don't know what happens once we, you know, commit the code and how actually people are using it. Uh, you know, do, do we go back and delete other practices that enable us to go and delete uh, features which nobody's using? I mean, you know, if you're a startup, these are things that becomes extremely critical for you because it's going to slow you down. But I don't think we seem to be focusing on those things. And rightly so, because back then that was the problem. Now I don't think that's the problem, so we need to move beyond it. And we need to talk about things that will help us solve today's problem. Everyone's talking about moving to the cloud. I mean, how is these things gonna help us get there? You know, how much focus is laid on the new ways of doing things? I think those are the questions to be asked. And by the way, sorry, one, one other thing. Certification is really killing us. I mean, I don't think anybody would debate on that. Uh, there is an assumption as to where we are and which problem we are trying to solve. I think some time back, uh, uh, Shane gave us a very good model about this thing. Uh, with a small group, he discussed four quadrants. Uh, I forgot what that model is called. Yeah. So in that model, basically it says that if the problem is well beaten, well defined, you know what to do, go with something, go with the best practices, right? 
like waterfall or whatever, you know, just, you know what to do, just get it done. Then when you know what to do, but you don't know how to do, that's where uh, agile, the development model comes in. Because now the question is not about what to do. And uh, when you don't know what to do, uh, that, that's where you're figuring it out. That's where lean, uh, lean models will come out because that's where you will fail fast. So it depends on which quadrant you are in. And uh, you know, that's a, that's a good mental model to have. So instead of just discounting Scrum, assuming that we are always in that, we don't know what to do, uh, is probably a mistake. It has its place. That's a very good point. Uh, the, the challenge is that we often fool ourselves thinking we know what needs to be built. And I think that's the hard part, right? How do you know what needs to be built if you don't, if you don't complete the cycle, right? If you're only going to focus on this saying, oh, we know what needs to be built, we just figure out how it needs to be built, then I think you miss the complete cycle. That's where I think things like lean startup, continuous de delivery, things like this are focusing on completing the cycle completing the whole thing so you know for which kind of problems where you will. It's not, it's not static. You know, there are certain kinds of problems where you know what needs to be done and how it needs to be done. There are certain kinds of problems where you don't know what the problem even is really, right? So the team is not static. The problems you're solving are not static. They don't fall into a quadrant and you just follow a process, right? So at different points in time, you will be in different quadrants, which is why you need to be thinking about something much bigger, uh, which is end to end, not just solving a piece of the puzzle. Next topic, yes. Who wants to propose the next topic? Uh, sorry, it's just a question for a couple of, uh, you know, for me just thinking. We, we, we have Agile Manifesto almost 11 half year old, right? And when we say Agile, we think if it's not working, we rapidly change. So what sort of opinions people carry in terms of the Agile Manifesto needs some changes because we see software craftsmanship has been a bit of one step ahead. Uh, not ahead, but extended the Agile Manifesto. So what our valuable speakers think in terms of Manifesto needs some sort of rewording or adding a fifth one, addition to the fourth four things we have already. I actually wrote a blog post a few years ago saying uh, the Agile Manifesto did its job, let's bury it, let's put it to rest, let's move on because it solved the problem. Now we moved on to solving a different problem. A lot of people got upset with that and they said that, that that's not expected from someone like you. You know, you should not be talking about things like this. Uh, so I think uh, I personally don't believe in going back and modifying things because that thing solved the problem, let's move on, right? Uh, there's craftsmanship, there is a lot of other stuff happening. I'm not sure if we need a manifesto. <laughs> we, we've had, we've seen the problems with manifesto. Uh, I don't know how many of you were here at the 2014 conference that we had. Uh, we had uh, Dave Thomas who came to the conference and he did a keynote at the conference. Dave Thomas was one of the original signatories of the Agile Manifesto. And uh, since the Agile Manifesto was written, he said he's never been to a single Agile conference. Uh, this was his first Agile conference after this, and he said, I wanted to get something off my chest, and which is why I want to talk at this conference. He's like, uh, long live Agile, uh, you know, let's just move on, right? It's, it's, it's done, it's moved, let's move on, because there is no such thing called Agile. There is not a lump of Agile sitting somewhere. It is about agility, and, you know, we put it in a manifesto, and we've kind of cornered ourselves thinking about it. So he gave a new manifesto if you're interested, and that manifesto is about uh, talking about uh, tacit knowledge. So he came up with a tacit knowledge manifesto, which I don't think many people talk about. So if you're interested to look at that, uh, that's a good video to look at. But the point I'm making is we don't need another manifesto. Manifesto generally corners us into thinking something. And that goes out of date very quickly, but people stick on to it for many, many, many years to come. And that does more bad than good. Next topic. Uh, I would like to introduce, we had a keynote today about scientific learning. So uh, for me, it's, I'm curious how to introduce the scientific methods and learning 
to our teammates or to teams we work in. Uh, like one alternative is to let's go and do a PhD on something and we will get seven years of practice and expertise into this re methodologies and why of research. But how can we do it in our software development teams and setups so that we can learn? Because the last half an hour I was wondering, what the hell is Scrum? Like I have worked across five teams, big teams, 100 people, small teams, four people. I kind of understand XP. I have read like five, six books, like XP, Art of Agile Development, Practice of Agile Development, all that makes sense. But all that is coming from some place that we want to move fast, we want to deliver better software, and these are the values that will help us do that. Uh, so I was kind of wondering why people are talking about Scrum when they will talk about like measuring empirically what works and do more of that or adjusting that. So I kind of, this uh, was a very great experience, but I kind of found that rigor missing. Like why are we not talking about measuring things empirically and improving them or uh, just basically scientific method more? I think you already know the answer. My question is, uh, see, understanding it and then how to actually uh, do more of it and do more of it as a team. Uh, any leads or any suggestions? So it's about experimenting. It's about small, cheap experiments. So the pattern in fearless change is called just do it. And you, I'm sure, have great ideas. And you may even have something specific that you'd like to try when you go back to your workplace. And now what you want to do is involve a couple of other people to try it with you. So just do it. Thanks. <laughs> I think I'm so impressed with the people in this country and that you have a lot of initiative and a lot of good ideas. You don't need me to tell you how to do some experiment. You already have an idea, don't you? Yeah, that's what I thought. Thank you. Anyone proposing the next stop? This is this is just what I read in Wikipedia you know, about pay programming. They did a little bit of empirical studies about pay programming, and some of the empirical studies, you know, suggested that. Uh, it's not working effectively. So I just wanted to propose this topic, you know. I don't know uh, both sides of it because I never experimented it yet. But I just wanted to understand whether there are any benefits of peer programming. And if, you know, what the empirical studies done by so many people out there which have actually, you know, presented their stuff in Wiki, is it the correct way or we just have to try and experiment by ourselves and see whether it's working or not. Just going based upon my own empirical studies, um, you know, what I found was that in my own company with the product development we do, um, when people did do some solo programming, on our product, defects went up. And so I've noticed that we have far fewer defects when we do pair programming. Um, you could say that, well, we could have replaced that with code review, but we, we tend to ship, as soon as we finish something, it ships, it, it goes into production with continuous deployment. So we like the pairing because it, it keeps the quality high, it keeps the defects low, and it's more affordable, believe it or not. That's more affordable than if we start to have a 
you know, a, a pile of defects to fix, it, you know, development is not as fun, and uh, our customers are unhappy, and so forth. So that's my own empirical, you know, uh, studies from that. So if you were at the keynote this morning, I did cite Lori Williams' book. She's one of the few people in our domain who's done an enormous amount of research about some of the little pieces of what agility is all about, and she spent a fair amount of time focusing on peer programming. And she has lots of experimental data that shows not only is it a practice that leads us to more productivity, whatever that is, but that the solution itself that arises from two brains looking at the code has higher quality, whatever that is. And so now there's plenty of evidence that shows clearly that what your initial reaction to pair programming is, is false. That we think that's a waste of time. We've got two people sitting coding when we could just have one person there, clearly. We've got two people, twice the effort expended for the same product. And so it is a practice that takes a certain amount of overcoming of resistance, especially by management. And I think now we have enough evidence that we can show that that's not the case. There are lots of other side benefits as well. I'm looking around for the guy from JP Morgan who talked about pairing. Has he gone? Okay, he also cited the paper that I mentioned this morning. It was in tandem with Lori Williams' book. We had Lori's book on one side, the reference on the other side was for Arlo Belshi. So they've done something similar at JP Morgan and measured the, uh, for them, ideal times for pairing, what kinds of pairings, uh, how long before pair rotation, should there be a break? How long should the break be? So he, he has presented some interesting data. It's a little bit different from Arlo's in his paper, so probably a different context. But people are starting to look at that now. And not only are we looking at things like defects or code quality, but what we can also see is other human benefits. He mentioned one, for instance, about bringing new people in on the team and the way they do promiscuous pairing, which means everybody pairs with everybody. They see faster introduction of new team members, less producing of a bottleneck because there is an expert who is the one who works on a particular area. Everyone knows everything. So there are other benefits besides increased productivity and increased quality. I think the benefits now are clear. If you look at what Menlo Innovations is doing, they pair every role. Now, to my knowledge at this point, they don't have two CEOs, but I think they're thinking about that. So if programming was about typing code, right? If programming was about typing code, pair programming was the lousiest idea anyone would come up with, right? But programming is maybe 10% about typing code, 90% about problem solving, about understanding the context, understanding the bigger picture, understanding where we are heading. And a lot of times you're not driving in the same territory you're driving in unknown territories. And when you're driving in unknown territory, people use the analogy of a navigator and a driver. And I think you know that's, that's something to consider. Now, I, I want to talk about, uh, so I talk a lot about benefits of pair programming. I encourage a lot of teams to do pair programming. Uh, I and Josh used to pair program quite a lot. He used to stay up late in the night, and I used to pair with him in the morning. And we used to do remote pairing, which, which a lot of people say is not possible. Uh, you know, remote pairing does not work. And I think, again, program pairing is not about typing code, right? If it was about typing code, the distributed, it becomes really hard. But it's about exchanging ideas. It's about getting on the same page. It actually works really well. Uh, since I left Industrial Logic, uh, I have uh, pretty much been a one-man show. So I have stopped pairing. 
right? I don't, I don't pair anymore on products I build. Uh, how do I feel about that, right? So is, is, it, is it really bad? I don't think so. Uh, I think I have, I see slightly improved productivity in, in the short run and whatever productivity means, to me I'm just talking about I can get stuff done more faster. Uh, it might have more bugs, it might, it might have other kinds of problems, but if I'm just looking at purely getting stuff done, if I'm working all by myself, I think I can get more stuff done. Uh, if nobody ever else has to look at the product I'm building, then I don't think it'll be a problem. But if you're working in a team environment where there are more than one people working on a product, uh, which in most enterprises it, that's the case, then if just one person is working, then there are knowledge silos and that creates other problems. So what I'm trying to get at is it depends on your context. Uh, you know, whether you want to use pairing or not, it's not a silver bullet in my opinion. Uh, if you're in an environment, I've been to many companies here in India where they're given the design spec. This is exactly the design spec you're going to follow. They're given the logic diagram of how you're going to write the logic, right? And they cannot change the framework, they cannot change things. That they, they have hard constraints around what they're operating. I think pair programming would be a waste of time in that specific environment, right? But if you said, yes, you could change the framework, yes, you could change, you don't need to follow the spec, you could come up with interesting things, then I think pair programming would have real advantages. But if you put a lot of constraints and people just have to do coding, not programming, I distinguish between the two. Coding is converting from one thing to another thing. You get a spec, you convert it to another, uh, you know, write it in the programming language. I think pairing is a waste of time. In fact, I think programming, uh, having people do that is a waste of time. You can just automate that and it could be done. Let's go a little bit in history. Um, earlier, people used to code alone. And uh, people realized later, uh, very soon, that you know, people are creating not really quality stuff. So let's review it. That's the you know, logical step. So people started reviewing it. Then there are, I, you, I keep using the word called uh, pseudo smart people. You know, they look smart, but I mean, they pretend smart, but they are actually not smart. So they came up with, you know, uh, four I review or whatever. They, they are reviewing actually, but on, only on paper or only on computer. I mean, they are not actually doing reviewing. They are just performing the process. So people figured out that, you know, this reviewing is not really benefiting. Then comes this pair programming concept. Now there are, I, I would like to say two aspects of pair programming, why in my opinion it's beneficial or how it's contributing. First aspect is technical stuff. Technical stuff in the sense, as he is mentioning, it's not typing. Typing is for possibly is the last step we are doing. Before that, we have to think over it, and most of the time, it's uh, uh, we just uh, we, we don't know uh, how to. I mean, there are there might be multiple ways to achieve what we want to do. So, what happens? We have to do a lot of thinking. So, if two minds are thinking and then uh, we are coding, then it's a much better process. So, that's the one of the one of the aspect the technical aspect of pair programming. The second aspect is people aspect. If two people are actually sitting together and they are uh, working together, then their personal bonding is getting mature. And what happens is, if I'm working as a silo s sitting somewhere and then I I'll be a little hesitant to ask him or him, hey, I got a problem here, can you help me? But if I'm He's just next to me, and the, we are working together as a pair, so my personal bonding will be much better. So I'll not be hesitant. And the problems keep up appearing. It's, I mean, it's a, uh, there will be no end to the problems. And if we are pairing it, then it's relatively easier to solve them. I just have one question. I mean, you're saying pair programming, as you rightly pointed out, it's not coding. Is there anything for the testers over here in this particular stuff? And when I say testers, because in most of the financial organizations, big organizations, we're still doing manual testing. 
we are not doing automation testing. So is there anything for the testers and when we say pay programming or it's only focusing on to the developers? I, d I don't think we actually want to strongly separate uh, testers and programmers as, as separate species. It's all right, you know, you just sit down and it's just code, it won't bite you, so you, uh, you just start understanding it uh, and uh, one day maybe they can, and it, it need not be very far away. I know a friend of mine who's actually a computer operator, this is some many years ago, but he went ahead and fixed bugs because those days there, there weren't all these processes to block the right person and the wrong person from doing this part and that part. So I think it is something that can be done. But coming back to pair programming, one of the things, points I want to make is, uh, we do, do always complain about complexity in code. And pairing, I think, is one great way to uh, maintain some sort of simplicity because two people have to actually understand it while, while, it's, while the code is forming. So I think that's, that's important to have simple code. I think pairing, uh, uh, we're talking about pair programming, but from testing point of view, we, a lot of organizations do pair testing. You have new joinees coming in, you're actually doing some inductions to them. So that's, it's just not pair programming. You're doing pair testing, you're also pairing with other roles like product owners or business analysts. So that's still part of the job. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm not countering. The main thing is you're again separating as pair testing versus pair programming. I think there's too much of separating development into its constituent parts, yeah. Uh, from, from what little I've experienced, there is pairing and pair programming. Pairing ten, tends to happen across roles. For example, if I'm a tester and you're a developer, we could be pairing. There is a story that you, you're, you're coding and I'm testing. While, while you're coding it, I'm looking at how to break the code. Uh, uh, how, you know how to make your code fail. So I'm designing tests that that can help that can break your code. Uh, pair programming is uh, b between two developers, but it can also happen between a developer and a and a tester. So back to your question: Is there something for testers? One thing that small thing that we are exper experiencing right now, we are experimenting right now, is pairing um, uh, as much as possible. W what's working for us in our company is. Uh, we try to hold on to a pair for at least a couple of iterations and then rotate pairs. So. Yeah. so I was just talking, I think we shouldn't limit to pair. Uh, there could be instances where I've seen four developers actually f focused on solving one problem for even a couple of days. So it's just not the pair, it's actually the team is looking at solving one problem and more uh, eyes on that uh, complex problem might give you better solutions. I think that's one way to look at it. <coughs> okay, I want to bring a very contrarian idea here. It's not limited to just pairing, but the concept of working in the team. So we had uh, someone, a uh, CTO of a company, he's quite old, he came over, we showcased the agile process and all, and he brought something very unique, uh, which left me thinking. He said, it, this all agile looks like some communist mumbo jumbo. Uh, you have these guilds and you have got these teams and whatever. So I have one question here. In the interest, when we make a team, are we somehow trying to curtail what we call as you know, individual geniuses? Some of the best inventions in history have been made by individual geniuses. Are we now going to a mode where we are like bringing in uniformity and uh, reducing the individuality in terms of software development or anything we do? Uh, before I go into that track, I have to add something about testing. One thing we are talking about having testers and pairing on it. One thing that we did not talk about is having as much automation as possible. Like, as developers, when we are writing unit tests or even when you are doing integration tests, we are trying to save time, especially time of people who will be testing, doing exploratory testing, as much as possible. So that's the motivation over there even when, when we are breaking down stories or writing integration tests, the motivation is more automation. So that's one point I think that was not being discussed here. Another thing, there are definitely merits to having testers, even working alone, doing exploratory testing. Uh, they can be product owners as well, those who have business domain expertise. And there is merit to having 
individual testers over there. I, I have not never seen anyone peer testing in that manner. Maybe sometimes in meetings and stuff, but there is merit to having like good business uh, domain knowledge who have to do exploratory testing. Yeah, so I just uh, wanted to echo the same point, but he, he talked for me, I guess. So uh, basically, uh, I see a lot of worry around testing here. So um, <clears throat> I, I agree that, you know, uh, there is no point in differentiating between development and testing going forward. So, uh, but one point we are missing, like there is one important quadrant about, uh, you know, test uh, you know, type of testing we do in Agile and the, uh, uh, that is a called as exploratory testing, right? So, but right now people are not getting enough time to do exploratory testing because things are not automated and they are spending time in checking, you know, what we call checking. Actually, it's not a testing, right? So if you want to do more testing, then first do more automation, automate all your regular checks, and then think about exploratory testing. You, know, you, will, you will do much better. Uh, talking about individual geniuses here, uh, the point that was already made was knowledge silos. So when I talk to someone in my previous team and someone hates me, like three months later, I am the one who is maintaining your code. Thing was, it's not that the design was bad at that point of time. I was happy. But the thing, he hates me because now he has to work on it and he has no idea like, how the code was structured. So maybe avoiding knowledge silos. Uh, that is fine, but uh, you have to understand that there are some people, like we have extroverts and introverts, we have some people who prefer to work alone and they're very good at doing that alone. And you have an organization and you have people who do that. How do you fit them into this entire structure of Agile, this team thing? How do you bring them in? So you changed the question on me. So I'm gonna ask your earlier question. Is that okay if I go back to that one? So the lone genius is a myth even Isaac Newton said, if I can see farther, it's because I've been able to stand on the shoulders of, yes. And what he did before he had his insights, his great insights about um, what became Newtonian physics, he was afraid of the plague. And so he went home and with him, he traveled with a large library, which was a luxury at the time. And he spent a lot of time reading what was in that library. And it was only after he had sort of had conversations with people who had written all of these great works before him was he able to come up with his insights. Now, he wouldn't have to do that nowadays. He could just have international communications with people over the web. But what we know is that not only Newton, but all great scientists work best by collaborating. If you were at the keynote this morning, and if you looked at that quote from the Nobel laureate from Cambridge, and he said, we used to all get together, and we'd have lunch, and we would share ideas that would lead to better science. So I think you'll find that that myth of the lone genius working away in the laboratory is just that, it's a myth. And that they've all at some level, whether it was Newton reading a lot of books or Einstein trying out his thought experiments or the Nobel laureate at Cambridge spending time over lunch and tea breaks discussing ideas, that we all work best with collaboration. Now, yes, some of us feel that we need time alone in order to incubate those ideas. Yes, there's probably an element of that. But I think we all also all benefit from the chance to collaborate and bounce ideas off others, even if those others are not particularly smart or maybe of our caliber, just having a conversation with another human being. It's a pattern that a friend of mine named jo James Noble wrote just the idea of talking to your dog can improve your ideas. So we as humans seem to need that time for collaboration, time for incubation. We need both. 